well, can I take this story a little bit further? I heard in the news that there's an obesity gene that's been discovered. And in fact, this is true. So three years ago, the gene FTO was discovered. Um, it, it basically, for each bad allele of FTO that we have, um, half of those of us in this room have at least one copy of the bad obesity gene. Makes you gain about three pounds, about half an inch of waist circumference, crave about uh, 200 more calories a day. And it's, it's not a serious illness. I mean, you, you don't become ill. But you can see its effect on the brain image. And so the first pictures here are the effect, the statistical effect of body mass index on regional brain volume. This is done with tensor-based morphometry. It's a voxel-based method for looking at regional brain volumes. So pretty much all of the brain it, it has a lower volume in people with higher body mass index. It's no surprise that people that carry the obesity risk gene um, also have a little bit more brain atrophy. So that's the, the way that you can build a connection from a trait that you understand down to the gene that affects it. So just kind of to summarize that, um, we found a gene that affects the brain. It wasn't really a brain gene, it was an obesity gene, but it's a reasonably uh, believable effect. Uh, it may be a direct effect on the brain or it may be working through BMI. Now why would you care about this? Well, it's kind of interesting. Depending on your obesity gene genotype, your body mass index may affect your brain in different ways. And you can start to do some very interesting studies where you say people with this genotype respond to certain things in one way, people without the genotype in another way. So that, that's sort of nutrigenetics or pharmacogenetics where you're looking at different responses based on someone's genotype. Now let's look at something a little bit more interesting. Three years ago, Alzheimer's genetics researchers were looking for more Alzheimer's risk genes. And the way that they do it is they APOE was known to be a risk gene since 1993. It triples your risk of Alzheimer's disease for every allele you carry, 15 times the risk, 9 to 15 times the risk if you have two copies of APOE4. But then there was a sort of gap of about 20 years where not a lot was found. And then three years ago, three genes were found that increase your Alzheimer's risk by about 20%, 10 to 20%. One of them was called CLU, or clusterin. Trouble is, nobody knew what clusterin did. There's just one variant of the gene that's carried more commonly by Alzheimer's patients. So imaging can help you answer that as well. You just collect a whole lot of images. This, these were DTI in this case. And the people that carried the bad Alzheimer variant of CLU had much worse or much lower fiber integrity FA on DTI scans. So this was sort of a physical record of carrying this gene a full 50 years before the disease typically hit. So that's an example where geneticists discover a gene, images then go and look in their image database and see if there's any visible difference. And lo and behold, there is a big difference in brain wiring. And th this can sort of taint your understanding of Alzheimer's a little bit, not as a sort of time bomb that goes off in old age, but something that's happening and you have a genetic basis for very, very young, uh, well before the, uh, the amyloid has built up. So this is something that you can do a lot of. So you can look at uh, schizophrenia risk genes. This is TRAC A. The neuroscientists here will recognize that as a neurotrophin, a growth factor gene. People with a bad version, I keep saying bad version, the one that gives you lower brain integrity or lower brain volume. Um, ha have visible differences on DTI scans. Uh, there's another gene called BDNF, uh, BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor. Um, there's a variant that has an effect on working memory. It's kind of interesting. And also on the uh, fractional isotropy of some of the areas uh, on DTI scans. So you could say, well, I'm a little bit fed up of hearing this list of genes. Can you just develop some genetic test to help predict your brain integrity? And you can. You, it, to some extent, you can. You could use a polygenic prediction model <coughs> excuse me, based on all the SNPs that you know as candidates. I'm only going to talk about candidates for another minute or so. But all the neuroscience we know can come up with uh, basically good leads in terms of what might affect the brain. And in our studies, we found that COMP, a dopamine pathway gene, these neurotrophins, BDNF is a growth factor, HFE is a, an ion transport gene, and CLU is an Alzheimer's risk gene. You could be genotyped for those genes. And based on the polymorphism that you have on your genome, we could predict reasonably well what your brain integrity was like on a, uh, on a DTI scan. You can predict about 7% of the variance, which may not sound like a lot, but it's uh, obviously a lot of other factors affected. So this leads to the notion that brain, brain imaging measures are arguably a good target for a genetic analysis, that somehow it may be easier to find genes that directly affect the brain than that affect uh, a psychiatric illness, for example. And we, we, we know that finding genes that affect schizophrenia, or autism, or major depression is very difficult. And the Psychiatric Genetics Consortium has, has uh, evaluated tens of thousands of people 
And usually when you get to about 30,000 people, you start to find some genes that have a statistical overrepresentation in patients. So the hope is, is it easier? Maybe we could just have fewer images. And when we set out on this, we had no idea whether you could find genes with 100 images or do you need 20,000. So we'll, we'll find out whether you need 20,000. So we set up a, a worldwide consortium. Um, I hope those of you viewing through the internet can see this. These are all the sites in Enigma. And to join Enigma, you have to have some type of brain scan, MRI, DTI, it could be amyloid scan, and a genome-wide scan. And I'll, I'll explain what that is in a moment. But it's a, it's a test of genetic variants for each of the people. And because of the problems in getting enough data to find these small effects, ADNI, which is a North American Alzheimer's disease project, pitched, it, pitched in 747 scans. You'll recognize different projects around the world. Some of them in themselves are consortia. So they had been collecting scans for some time. And they basically said, well, we'd like to pitch in all our data. Let's try and work together and find out which variants in our DNA affect things we can measure in these scans. So how would you find a genetic variant that affects brain structure, or any brain measure for that matter? Well, let, let's say we're looking for a gene that affects the size of your head. So there's, there's some people here with large blue heads, just as a, an example. So when you go along your, your uh, genome, there are certain locations where you and I or different people in the room have a different letter. 99.9% .9 of our genome is the same. It's very, very similar from subject to subject. But there are these SNP, single nucleotide polymorphisms, where often there's a change in the letter in the sequence. Some of them don't have any effect on the proteins or biochemical pathways in the brain, and others do. And some of them may have an effect where, it's called an association, where carriers of one type of the uh, SNP, A in this example, have bigger heads. I'm using that as a silly example. And if that happens, you could do a sort of little regression plot, as you can see there, um, and basically show that the bigger head people had different genotypes. And that would be one way of uh, proving a genetic association. So what do genome-wide association studies try to find? Well, we're trying to find common genetic variants related to a brain measure or a disease. Now, there's sort of three philosophies in genetics. One is that a lot of the genes that affect psychiatric illness will be common. They're reasonably commonly carried. They're not extremely rare. The other philosophy is that they may actually be very rare indeed. There may be many, many causes of psychiatric illness from genetic variants that are very, very rare. And the others are thinking of other types of genetic variation other than coding changes like methylation, epigenetic changes. So these are sort of different schools of thought in genetics. GWAS, or genome-wide scanning, is one of the simplest methods you could use. And one of the things that you do is you look at all of your um, genetic code, and there's rather a lot of it. One type of variation is this single nucleotide polymorphism, or a single letter change in your genetic code. And a lot of these variants have names, these RS numbers that you can see there. And within a gene, there are exons, introns, and SNPs. And they, they can, th these little single letter variants can be anywhere there. And one person may have a C and a G. Another person may have a T and an A. And the consequence is the protein that's made, it might be a neurotransmitter receptor, it might be a growth factor, has a slightly different affinity. It might, might have a different function. It may be a cell adhesion model, a cell adhesion molecule that doesn't do quite as good a job at guiding axons to where they're supposed to go. So these are usually moderately benign changes that don't cause you to be ill, but they'll cause a moderate difference in either the myelination or the, the function of uh, neurons. So we talked about a candidate gene on the left there. Let's say we think BDNF, you know, there's people with different forms of BDNF. Maybe we think that the brain volume or some particular brain trait relates to that. Imagine doing that at half a million different places on the genome. So if we didn't go into this knowing which particular ones would be fruitful, you could do that statistical test of association with a brain measure at each of half a million different locations. Now you can say, well, why half a million? I mean, can't you do any more? And these genotyping chips basically try and densely measure a genetic variation. Genetic variants are correlated. And so if you look in a very, very small window, different variants tend to be inherited together. So these are like little lighthouses illuminating different areas along the genome that you, you, you can look at. And the plot that I'm showing you there on the right is called a Manhattan plot. And so they're just like skyscrapers in Manhattan. It looks like it has skyscrapers in it. Those little blobs there, when there's a little green one, it's the log of the p-value of the association between that genetic variant and the brain measure. And so when those little dots are really high, it means it's extraordinarily unlikely to be a chance thing that that little genetic variant on the genome was related to the brain measure that we're looking in. So that, that's what a genome-wide association study is, where you look at all of these different SNPs. There's a problem with doing that. 
And those of you that are familiar with imaging will be familiar with what type of problem this is going to be. You're looking at too many tests. So you hope to find a statistical association that's stronger than 20 million to one. Well, why, why is that? Well, if you did a Bonferroni correction for all these little variants that you're looking at, and let's say you look at a million, well, our standard uh, false positive rate that's reasonable for a study is 0.05. If you're doing a million tests, you better have a one in 20 million cutoff rate. So this is kind of a problem. If you have a good candidate gene, you can publish your paper in Nature or Science with a 0.05 p-value. If you screen the whole genome without any hypothesis in advance, you're going to have to have a 10 to the minus 7. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't lots of genes that are important that are way down there in the non-low-hanging fruit, but you're really looking for these top p-values that, that are going to jump out. And if you collect a big enough sample, you'll find them eventually. And it's ba basically a challenge of getting enough data. So the first genome-wide screens of brain images started about 2009. And one of the ways it became possible is ADNI, or the Alzheimer's Disease Neuroimaging Initiative, collected about seven to 800 images in a very uniform way, and they put all the genomic scan data on the internet. Now, that's a little bit unusual. It's very, very uncommon to put people's genetic data on the internet. There's pri privacy concerns. There's a lot of issues of identifying the person. Do they have a risk gene, like a breast cancer risk gene? There's, so that, that set a precedent for people, and you, you, you can download this data. You can get it from the internet. Basically screening all these genetic variants in relation to measures they care about. So th this was a study of temporal lobe volume. Many people looked at amyloid in the brain or cognitive measures. You look at whatever you like because the data's there. And one of the top genes there, you see that one that just breaks the, the bar, that very, very high bar that you have to beat to, to be considered significant. Um, that's a gene that uh, has a variant that affects uh, temporal lobe volume uh, in the ADNI cohort. And it's interesting. It's a glutamate receptor gene. And so... Uh, uh, GRIN2B uh, codes for a glutamate receptor subunit, and that was already a target of Alzheimer's therapy. And so that, that, that was sort of exciting, that, that uh, people that carry a TT um, in their genetic code in this uh, uh, DNA code for this receptor have about 2.8 more percent temporal lobe atrophy on average. And you, you can do a voxel-wise test. So just like in uh, SPM, you can look at where a particular covariate fits with... Uh, uh, atrophy or functional signals in the brain, you can map the effect of the gene, and there, there it is. That effect was later replicated in younger people. And so that, that's a really cool example of scanning the genome and finding a gene uh, that kind of makes sense. So this sort of notion that brain images are a good target for genetic analysis is based on this sort of triangle here. So the, the poor person over on the right there has some illness. And the measures that you can derive from the person with illness might be clinical scores, cognitive scores, but because of the non-repeatability, or I mean, I've got to be careful what I say, they're, they're slightly more variable and more, more, more difficult to know exactly what they're measuring, there's a notion that the DNA more directly affects features you can see on an image, and maybe those features on an image are good proxies for what's happening to the person. Now, that's a supposition. It's a, it's a model. Maybe, maybe there's genes that affect illness that can never have effects that are seen on images, but for, for some, this is a good model. So just talking about that example... Um, we knew that temporal lobe volume was related to Alzheimer's disease. We found genetic variation in the glutamate receptor that was related to temporal lobe volume. And then in a follow-up study, we found that carriers of this risk gene, Alzheimer's patients tended to carry more than the standard amount of the uh, bad gene, making it a, a, an Alzheimer's-associated gene. Now, th this is kind of a poster child for imaging genetics. We talked a lot about genes that people knew about anyway, and what do they do to brain images. This was a gene, FRMD6, where four or five different studies discovered it affected something in an image. They were, they were discoveries in ADNI, and nobody knew what the gene did. They, they just found different parts of the genome that I'm pointing to there, 